tales for dark nights. A series of bizarre events swept the town of Brereton, North Dakota. The town was Leon Maxwell's ideal place to take a vacation. Not only did he have family in the area, but it was peaceful. This year, however, his vacation was much longer than usual. Leon was an accomplished writer. His wife, Claire, thought it was a great idea for him to do a story on his hometown. Leon could not leave until the novel was finished. The cold and harsh winter this year was just as bitter as the previous ones, with temperatures cold enough to chill someone to the very bone. It didn't help matters much that some of the winters could very well last into May. Leon loved the quietness of the town, but after a month, he missed interaction with people, and so he got a seasonal job at the sugar refinery. Leon, along with the rest of the town, would be troubled by the upcoming days. One evening, he arrived at his house and saw more snowmen in people's yards than the day before. He wouldn't have thought anything of this except that there was now a snowman in his yard, and he surely didn't make it himself. Once inside the house, Leon questioned his wife about the snowman. She told him she didn't even know there was a snowman in their yard until he brought it up. Leon also found a gift on the table. It didn't belong to him or his wife, and nowhere on the gift did it hint who it was from. He was curious and picked it up, even tried to shake it to see if he could hear anything. For now, Leon left it on the table and invited some friends to his house that night to talk a few things over. They were sitting around a squared table playing a card game. During the game, Leon brought up the snowman that was made in his yard and the mysterious gift he received. All of Leon's friends admitted to a snowman appearing in their yards, too, along with the gift in their homes. Chris, Leon's next-door neighbor, spoke up, I don't even have any children, and my wife hates the snow, so I know she wouldn't even try to make a snowman. He continued on, As for the gift, I, I opened it. Well, at least the wrapping paper. I have no idea what is inside. What are you talking about? Leon questioned. Chris told Leon and everyone else in the group that the gift was just a box, a box that is locked and didn't come with a key. Chris mentioned he did everything he could to try to open it, even smashing it, but it's as tough as titanium. Leon thought it was odd to be given such a gift with no way to open it or know what's inside. Claire mentioned that she tried calling the police all day, but everyone has apparently reported the same incident so it'll be a while before the police get to their home. After the game, Leon had all of his friends go home, and then he went to sleep. After the game, Leon had all his friends go home, and then he went to sleep. For the most part, the next day for Leon was normal, until he returned home and checked the mailbox. Inside was a sealed, unmarked envelope. He walked inside of his house to show his wife as he started to open the envelope in front of her. A key fell out. The key had no company name or numbers on it. There was also a note inside the envelope. This note mentioned a gift and said not to open it until Christmas. Both Claire and Leon looked at each other and then the gift they got yesterday. Could this be a twisted prank? Before either of them even thought to open the gift and unlock the box, they heard a loud and horrific yell. It sounded just like their next-door neighbor Chris. Leon told Claire to stay home as he rushed over to Chris's house. He banged on the door and tapped on the window, but no one answered. Leon finally lost his patience and broke down the door. Fear instilled every fiber within his soul when he stepped his way into the kitchen. There was Chris, but his left arm was missing and his throat had been slashed. A pool of blood surrounded the victim. The face left on his friend was that of pure terror. Leon rushed out of the home, and when he returned to Claire, he called the police. When the police arrived, Leon was sent to the station for questioning. Claire was also at the station, but was questioned in a separate room. The officer asked mostly about her husband, starting with where he worked. She responded, he's a writer. He doesn't live in Brereton anymore, or even North Dakota for that matter. Leon visits this town once a year because only about 800 people live here. No publicity and no fans. Is he going to give us a hard time, said the officer. 
I can't definitively say yes or no. Uh, Leon is the kind of person that if you treat him right, he'll give you the shirt off his back to help you out. However, if he's treated like a suspect, you won't get him to answer a single question, even if you interrogate him for hours. And if he does, I can say with absolute certainty, it won't be the kind of answer you like. Meanwhile, a group of teenagers are having a party held at their friend's house. By now, nightfall has approached. The music was so loud that they didn't hear the constant knocking at the door. One teen finally sees the door open and quickly goes to the stereo to turn down the volume. When the teen walked over to see who it was, it appeared the person must have ran off. The power just then went out and the inside of the home was covered in complete darkness. A glimpse of moonlight peered over a rather odd figure. It seemed to be a man with black gloves and boots, a red suit and a bag over his shoulder. His face was masked by the dark, but the teens were sure the man in red was not invited. It was becoming clear that someone was trying their best to look the part of old St. Nick. The disguised man took out a straight-edge razor, flipped it open, and stabbed his victim right to the heart. Bone-chilling shrieks and cries ensued. Some of the teens fled for their lives, while others watched, petrified in fear. When the razor travels within the victim's chest, it slits open into four separate blades to enhance the torture. The teen lived long enough to see his own heart get pulled out of his body. Didn't seem like Santa was done with his massacre yet. The other teen was a girl, and she tried to flee. The jolly old man pulled out a second weapon. This one looked like a chain of razors. He swung the chain, and it wrapped around the teen's arm. She tried to pull away, even though it made the blade slowly dig deeper into her skin and rip the flesh off. By now, the rest of the teens scattered, and the girl was left to fend for herself. As painful as it was, she ripped herself free from the chain of razors and ran up the stairs in a frantic fury. She trips midway and falls on the unforgiving stairs, hearing her leg snap. Her cries by this point fell on deaf ears, desperately trying to crawl to safety. Slowly, the man in the suit walked up to the stairs. He walked the first step, then the second step, and he spoke in a harsh tone. "'You better watch out.' You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Now he was on the fifth step, moving up to the sixth. The teen's eyes dilated as unspeakable harm was about to be reaped upon her soul. She would try to climb faster, but her mind was disoriented, bound by the terror that consumed within. She heard him say, I see you when you're sleeping. I know when you're awake. I know when you've been good or bad. She quickly turned around and let out a shrill screech just as a straight edge lodged itself into the palm of her hand. The blade not only went through her hand, it cut into the floor. As painful as it was, she pulled away, which made her hand nearly slice in half. The stairs covered in the crimson of pain she felt was never ending. She couldn't see the attacker because her eyes were so flooded in tears. She shook violently to get away from his grasp. But the man in the red suit hoisted her over his shoulders and threw her through the second-story window of the home. Shards of glass pierced her skin and the scarlet rivers melted the snow when she landed on the ground. She laid there, lifeless. The howling winds outside droned out their screams. Hours passed, and it was clear that Leon was feeling uneasy at the police station. The officer on the other side of the table said, You can understand, I hope, when I say we find your story lacking credibility. When we arrived at your neighbor's house, there was no body. Either you're lying to us to cover something else up about your missing friend, or this killer has taken his time to leave absolutely no trace of evidence behind. There were no hair follicles, no fingerprints from the killer. We couldn't even find any blood that might have seeped under the floorboards. Would you like to start back at the beginning, starting with the truth this time? Leon didn't appreciate possibly being accused of his own friend's murder. His skin was more pale than usual as he dealt with the reality of having lost a good friend. The same friend he would visit every year when he came to the town of Brereton. Leon ran his hands through his dark hair and responded to the officer. You got me. I did it. I did that horrible deed. The second part of my plan was to set out some pastries when you got to the house so you would stop and eat them. That way, when you gave me chase, you'd get stuck in the doorway. It's just a shame you arrived so fast. Calling you down to set up my trap was all for nothing. 
Just as the officer was about to say something, the door opened behind him, and a man who addressed himself as Detective Peter Larson walked in. He mentioned he came from out of town to help investigate the people that have mysteriously gone missing. It turns out since this interrogation, other people have disappeared. The officer was still intent on getting a confession out of Leon. Your eyes are all red. Have you been drinking? Leon slowly looked up and responded, Officer, your eyes look glazed. Have you been eating donuts? It looked like the officer was reaching for his baton, but the detective stepped in and said he'd take over. The officer glared at Leon and then slowly walked out of the room. Larson would approach Leon and said, Don't let that officer get to you. He's just trying to solve the case, just like everybody else. You're free to go if you wish. Leon got up and was about to leave when the detective added, You know, being a writer, you could be crucial to this investigation. You might even know some details that we could have overlooked. I'll even let you in on some things the police haven't released to the public yet if you agree to help us on this. You're the only person that has actually seen a dead body as of right now, if what you said is true. Leon opened the door, tempted to step through it. This isn't why I came here, Leon responded. The detective was a persistent one and retorted, So, uh, it's better to do nothing and let more people possibly go missing? If you walk out, can you deal with the lives that might have been spared by helping us? Leon shrugged. He looked outside the doorway as if it would be so easy to just leave. His head hit the door in frustration, and then he let go of the door handle and walked back to the detective. Fine. But the deal is, my wife gets placed safely somewhere until this case is solved. With that, the detective agreed and shook Leon's hand. Knowing that Leon had already had a long night, the detective agrees, let him catch up on some much-needed rest, and decides to start the investigation tomorrow on Leon's day off. Elsewhere, in the town of Brereton, on Shakespeare Road, a man and a woman are sitting at home by the warmth of a cozy fire. They have all the lights off and are drinking hot cocoa. They thought they heard a sound, but brushed it off as being the sound of the wind. Suddenly, soot poured down from the chimney and put the fire out. The home was as black as midnight. The couple attempted to find the lights, but couldn't even see the hands in front of them. They heard someone, or something, slide down the chimney and walk inside their home. The bag the stranger had hoisted over his shoulders glowed. The person that intruded the couple's home was none other than old St. Nick. The man, dressed in red, pulled out some lights that were attached to barbed wire. He would let out a smile. The woman ran into the living room and up the stairs. Midway up the stairs, her body sliced in half as a horrendous scream was heard from her and she fell. The other half of her body lay motionless. A row of razor blades was attached from one end of the stair rail to the other, and when the woman ran through it, she cut her own body in half. The man in the red suit quickly and violently grabbed a hold of the other victim and threw him across a glass table. The man was cut badly and hurt, but Santa was not content. He dragged the man up the stairs, wrapped his neck around with barbed wire lights, tied the other end to the stair railing, then tossed the man down over the stairs so that he would hang. In just a few moments, the bodies of the man and woman of the household were lifeless. In the morning, Leon got a phone call. He was slow to answer upon waking up. It was a police officer, and he mentioned that Detective Larson would be at his home at any moment. Just as the officer announced this to Leon, he hears Peter knocking on his door. After Leon let Peter inside the home, the detective brought up how there has been two more missing people reported. They didn't stay long at the house before they were hurried over to the scene of the crime. When Detective Larson and Leon arrived, the detective showed his badge to the officers who let them through. Once inside the home, Larson explained that a couple named Barry and Annette Castello lived there. It was Barry's boss that called when he didn't arrive at work that morning. In the twelve years that Barry had worked there, he had never been late to work once. Larson showed Leon around the home and then showed Leon photos taken just a few days ago. In the background of those photos was a glass table in the kitchen area, but strangely, now it's gone. Just like before, no one was home, but Leon noticed weapons were left behind. We wouldn't let the public know about it, but if this is the work of the killer, he always leaves his weapon behind. 
He leaves them all to a pristine shine and cleans them so well we can't get a drop of DNA from the weapons. Why would he leave his weapon and nothing else? questioned Peter. Leon wondered for a moment and then said, because he wants to get caught. He doesn't want to make it too easy for him to be found. He only wants someone worthy enough to catch him. I know there is a murder out there because I saw Chris's body. I bet when I arrived, the killer didn't expect someone to show up so quickly, so he left and then returned to the scene of the crime later. Leon walked into each room carefully. He saw the metal box that Chris told him about, the box everyone got as a gift. Leon saw that the box had been opened, the key still in the lock. Something Chris didn't mention before his murder was that the box had two lights, a red light and a green light. Both of them were in the front of the box, but only the red light was lit up. Leon went to inspect the weapons. One of them was razors that were wrapped around the stairwell. When turned to the side, it would be very difficult to spot them in dim lighting. These razors, they've been cut and reshaped to line up into each other. You can't find anything like this out at a normal everyday store. I would check to see if anyone in the area owns some kind of workshop. I think the killer would have had to set up this trap on the stairs previously, which means he either knew the victims or knew when there would be a way to set it up. One officer shook his head and responded, That sounds a little far-fetched. How would he know the couple wouldn't discover the trap earlier on before the day he showed up? Leon paced himself, put his hand in his coat, and said, He probably didn't. He took a gamble. If the couple were like me, I don't go upstairs until I'm ready to go to bed. Leon looked at the blade once more, his eyes looking puzzled. One of the officers took off his hat as if he was embarrassed to even mention what he was about to say. We think whoever is responsible for the missing people is dressing up like Santa Claus. We got a call from various teenagers that they saw a man dressed in red and white with a bag over his shoulder. Unfortunately, the lights in the home went out and it was too dark to get a visible ID on him. Leon felt like he had almost all of the pieces of this case to put together the killer's motive. As he tried to run everything through his mind, he looked out the window to the home across the street. A few kids were playing in the snow and even had a snowball fight. One of the kids thought it would be fun to beat up the snowman and took out a baseball bat. He swung at the snowman's head and gave two or three good strikes. Suddenly, the head came off and it tumbled over onto the driveway. As it did, the snow revealed a human head where the snowman's head once was. Blood seeped through the body of the snowman and all the kids screamed and ran away. The police, along with Leon, rushed over as fast as they could. Now it was all too clear what happened to the bodies, and Leon tried his best to explain what he thought the killer's intentions were. Leon brought up how he felt the keys and the gifts in the people's homes were a way to tempt the wicked. In other words, people that were bad would open the box and the light under it turned red. The people that were good left their gifts alone until Christmas and the box remained with a green light. Once the red light is activated, it stays activated even if the box is locked back up. One officer shouted, Why the heck would he hide the bodies in a snowman? Leon shook his head annoyed. It's the last place most people would think to look. Even during all of your searching, you never stop to think the bodies might be hidden inside of a snowman. It's the perfect hiding place. The bodies in the snowman are a reminder of those that have been naughty, at least in the criminal mind. He wants everybody to see who's been bad. Leon felt into his coat and took out a key and remembered something else he wanted to find out. At first, I thought maybe someone from the post office might have been delivering all of the keys. He's the only one during normal circumstances that could go into everyone's mailbox without looking suspicious. But I realized this year has been some strong snowstorms. The killer could probably kill someone even in broad daylight and go unnoticed. There is something about that note that came with the key in the envelope that troubles me. Does anyone have a typewriter I can use? I want to see if that note was made by either using a computer or was typewritten. The idea caught the officers off guard. Almost no one used a typewriter these days, so the thought that the killer might have used one to make the note instead of typing it out on the computer eluded them. 
Detective Larson mentioned he still keeps a typewriter that's been passed down from generation to generation in his family and would allow Leon to use it. Also, it just occurred to me that the 27th annual Christmas show is going to be coming up. It's done here every year. Might be a good idea to have extra security around when it happens, Leon concluded. In the following days, nothing happened, and Leon had time to study some of the other weapons the killer had possibly used, such as the straight edge and razor whip. He was sitting in an office with the detective. This man's truly crazed. Most weapons were tools at some point, but these were only designed with pain in mind. The whip appears to have piano wire running through the sides of the blades so that the the whip appears to have piano wire running through the sides of the blades so that way it will recoil. I have an idea how he strengthened the metal so it would cut through the bone, but it's only a hunch. I thought of something similar and used it in one of my horror novels about giant spiders. He might have found a way to infuse metal with spider silk. The silk, used to make spider webs, is considered to be at least ten times stronger than the armor and bulletproof vests. As the detective wrote down a few notes, an officer walked in and told him today is December the 7th, the day of the Christmas show. Let's get going then, Detective Larson shouted out. But Leon was still persistent in looking at the evidence and said he wanted to go home to check up on something. He told Detective Larson to go ahead without him and he would meet him at the show later on. Leon went home to take a look at the typewriter that Detective Larson let him borrow. First, he tried to see if he could distinguish the difference between something typewritten and something printed out from a computer. He typed out a word on the typewriter, then took out the paper. Upon close inspection, he could tell there was a difference in using the typewriter, and it became clear that it was the preferable method of the killer when he matched it up to the lettering on the note. He took the typewriter to the police station for further investigation. After a few hours, he found some interesting discoveries and called in a few of the police officers. He asked where Detective Larson was, and one of the officers mentioned he was showing Claire the holding cells in the police station. The lights in the station would flicker a bit. At that point, Leon wanted to mention something. The lights completely turned off. The backup generators kicked in, and Leon tried telling the officer something, but the officer said in a rush, The security cameras aren't working. I have to figure out what's going on. Whatever it is you wanted to tell me, and wait till I get back. Leon, at a loss for words and frustrated, didn't have time to banter. He was now just focused on getting to the holding cells. He made his way into the room and saw Detective Larson and Claire inside one of the holding cells. The prison door shut behind and locked Detective Larson and Claire in, leaving Leon on the outside as he rushed over. He looked at Claire and then back at the detective, frantic. I thought you went to the Christmas show. The detective lit up into a smile and said, I did. After a while, the security said I wasn't needed there, so I came back. Claire said she got bored walking around the station all day, so I thought I'd show her where we detained the prisoners before sending them off to jail. Leon looked at his wife, then back to Detective Larson. Leon seemed awfully nervous. He whispered to the detective, Look, I know what's going on now. It's all over. Let my wife go. Detective Larson looked at Leon, confused, and there was a look of concern on Claire's face. Just stop pretending and give yourself up. I know you're the one that put those notes in everyone's mailboxes. You're the serial killer. You thought you would never get caught, didn't you? He probably forgot the typewriter ribbon stored everything you wrote. Every character you depressed on the keyboard was your admission of guilt. I don't need any other evidence. Just stop playing the innocent game and unlock the cell now. The detective's eyes dilated. He looked shaken up. His body looked like it was about to distort, but it held together. A grin that didn't look at all jolly showed on the killer. He put on some gloves and turned around to face Claire. Detective Larson started to sing. I'm making a list and checking it twice. Going to find out who's naughty or nice. Claire backed away as far as she could from Detective Larson, demanding Leon to help her. Leon wanted to get reinforcements, but at the same time, he was too afraid to leave Claire with the detective. He was able to reach through the bars enough to grab the back of Larson's coat, but his grasp was soon pried away. Detective Larson looked under his boot and took out some tools. They were in separate pieces, and as he attached them, they made an axe. 
He pressed a button on the handle, and spikes protruded up over the sides and top of the axe so that he could saw into his victim as he was cutting. He inched his way to Claire. She was in a frenzy as Leon yelled, Larson, don't! The lights flickered again and went out. A loud scream was heard. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights